crystal bindings. What are these? What types of bonds do we know in materials? The basic picture I want you to have coded or burned into your head is the one shown here. Um, these are the most important types of interactions of bindings in solid state material. On the left top hand side, we see so-called Van der Waals bonding. Um, this is an interaction between pretty much uh, electrically neutral char uh, particles where we have interaction between charged dipoles. We'll be dealing with this a lot to see where does the interaction, uh, source of the interaction, where does it come from? Um, this kind of interaction has no directionality. So this is the important thing. That means uh, it does not really matter whether two atoms are arranged along certain direction. The interaction has the same strength in all directions. Um, the prominent examples of materials bonded using Van der Waals bonds are uh, rare earth, uh, sorry, rare gas solids. So solids of uh, helium, uh, neon, argon, xenon, and so on. Um, another type of material where Van der Waals bonding is prominent is graphite, as you probably know, and many other are uh, layered to the materials where the interplanar binding between the graphene planes is mostly via Van der Waals bond. The situation there is a little bit more complicated. It is not only Van der Waals bond. Uh, therefore, uh, we do not say it here as a, as a typical example. The next type of bond are ionic bonds. Similarly to Van der Waals bonds, uh, it has no directionality. And uh, this comes from the fact that it's similarly again to Van der Waals uh, bonds based on the electrostatic interactions. And we know from physics that the strength of the interaction, the Coulombic forces, they do not really depend on the direction of the two charges of the two uh, charged particles. The only uh, thing that matters are the charges on these two charges. For ionic materials, we need at least two different species because we need charge transfer from one neutral species into another neutral species by which we create the positively and negatively charged ions. That's where the name ionic comes from. Um, we can have more than two species, of course. Uh, but two species is the minimum. Charge transfer, this is the key word that, uh, that should be remembered here. The ionic bonds are significantly stronger and actually they are among the strongest bonds uh, in the materials. They are significantly stronger, of course, than the Van der Waals bonds, which are out of these four ones here, the weakest. Metallic bonds, the easiest way how to uh, imagine those is that uh, each of the element that is then uh, participating in this bonding gives away one or two or more electrons, valence electrons. These become delocalized, which means that they will be shared between uh, all atoms. They are sort of freely occupying the space between the ionic pores, the positively charged remaining ionic pores. They form a sea of electrons via which the positively charged uh, metals are uh, bonded. Okay. Again, the basis of this interaction is the electrostatic interaction, and therefore there is no directionality. It does not matter that much where these two atoms are, how they are arranged, what is the bond between them. Of course, when we then arrange them, in the crystalline structure, it starts matter, mattering. Yeah, but uh, uh, to at, at the interaction of pairs or triplets, the directionality does not play any role. Uh, this fact: that the metallic bonds are relatively weak, meaning that they can be easily 
broken and rebonded together with the fact that they do not prefer any directionality or they do not exhibit any significant directionality leads to a very good plastic deformation. So these mat materials become uh, easy shearable as well as uh, plastically deformable. The final example that we have here are covalent bonds. Covalent bonds are um, typically based on sharing uh, electrons, but sharing electrons not in the metallic manner when they become very delocalized, but on the other hand, they become uh, fairly localized in so-called molecular orbitals. They become localized typically in between of the positively charged ions uh, by which they, uh, they create a network of the, of the bonds. Uh, these bonds are extremely directional, means uh, apart from being very strong, they are very difficult to be uh, bent, and hence the covalently bonded materials are typically fairly brittle. They are strong, but brittle. And so this is uh, one uh, example of uh, either semiconductors or ceramic materials where the covalent bonds become quite important. So let us try to talk a little bit more about a model for Van der Waals bonding. What we want to create here is an understanding how does the Van der Waals bond uh, originate? Where does it, uh, how, how is it created? Um, maybe you have seen in some textbooks that Van der Waals bonding is an interaction between an oscillating charges. What do we mean by that is that because of the oscillations of, of atoms, fluctuations of the complete charge density, uh, because of the lattice vibrations, or simply because of the statistical nature of uh, materials and nature, the negative charges, the electronic clouds, will become slightly displaced with respect to the positively charged ionic pores. So the electronic cloud becomes displaced by which if we think now about a um, sort of charge center of mass of the electrons, where is the, um, where to place one point charge that represents the electronic cloud. This now be becomes uh, different from the position where the point charge representing ionic core is placed. And as soon as I have plus and minus charge, they create a dipole. And dipoles interact with another dipoles in the material. Again, a displaced electronic cloud from the ionic charge. And this is now the source for the underhouse. So let us describe these oscillations and electrostatic interactions on a model where we consider first the interaction between two such dipoles. And uh, when developing the understanding, we need to create a model which hopefully represents reasonably the reality. So what you see here is a decoupled plus and minus charge. Of course, they are not fully decoupled, so the electronic cloud cannot leave the positively charged ionic core completely. Right? It's still the electronic cloud from that atom. So this interaction is uh, visualized here by this spring, uh, which means that the more I displace the electronic cloud away from my ionic core, the larger is the force which tries to bring it back. Okay? So these are indeed the fluctuations of the electronic cloud around the ionic core rather than just randomly floating charge. The same thing happens for the atom number two. So we can have again the um, positively charged uh, ionic core and electronic cloud. The displacements are labeled here with, with x1 and x2. And the total distance between the atoms measured as the distance between the ionic cores is labeled with R. 
what we are going to do is to write down all electrostatic interactions between these charges. So we have the repulsive force between the positively charged uh, ions. We have the repulsive force between the negatively charged ionic clouds. So this is now the nicest thing. Okay. And then we have the attractive force between the positively charged ionic cores and the negatively charged electronic clouds. Now, by these guys, these uh, positively charged ionic cores and electronic clouds, I mean the interaction between those entities from different atoms. Of course, there is an interaction between the positively charged ionic core and the negatively charged electronic cloud from the same atom. This is, of course, there, but this is what is there, what is there even when we do not have interaction with another atom. Right? So what we are writing down here is the interaction between two different atoms, not within the one atom. Good. When we know this, we simply write down the total kinetic energy and the total uh, um, electrostatic uh, energy corresponding to this, this Hamiltonian, right? So um, we start with writing down the kinetic and potential energy of a non-interacting system. This means that we have one electron, uh, sorry, one atom, and we have another atom, and they do not see each other. So they are completely decoupled. They, they, they do not uh, interact with each other. And the interaction, the, the total energy of atom number one is, of course, the kinetic energy here, kinetic energy of atom number one, and the potential energy of the atom number one, which is here, in simple terms, uh, represented by the uh, spring energy, okay, spring potential energy. The same thing we write here for the atom number two and also its potential energy, atom number two. Knowing that, we know what would be the uh, vibrational eigenfrequencies of each of these atoms. They are two identical atoms. They show the same masses. They have the same spring constants K meaning that the interaction again between the core and the electronic cloud within one atom is the same. And uh, then we simply write down the solution for an harmonic oscillator. We end up with the eigenfrequency omega equals uh, square root of K over M. This is a classical mechanics. I believe you have seen this a billion times before. And the total energy of the system is then given simply by uh, summing up the total harmonic energies. So the H0 equals one half H omega zero. And we have two of these oscillators, right? Good. Sorry, H bar omega zero. Good. Now we can do something more. In theory, we can now switch on the uh, interaction. So in addition to this Hamiltonian H0, which was the total energy of the system of two atoms, but non-interacting atoms, we now add a term which corresponds to the interaction between two uh, displaced charges, so really the electrostatic interaction, as we said before, between those guys, those guys, those guys, right? So let's write this down. We end up with the Hamiltonian that we have here. So again, there should not be any terms that, should, that, that, that surprise you. All what we see here is always an electrostatic interaction. We see from this prefactor, uh, we see that we assume that both the electronic 
cloud as well as the Ionic 4, um, they end up with a charge, a total charge corresponding to one electron plus or minus, right? So this first part here is the electrostatic interaction, the repulsion between the two ionic cores. Repulsion because the energy, the total remaining energy that comes out of this interaction is positive. So by putting the atoms far apart, increasing R decreases the total energy. That's the uh, origin of the repulsion. This is the repulsion between the two electrons. And then we have here the interaction between one core and one electron or from the, uh, another surrounding atom. And then we have here finally the interaction between other atomic core and the first uh, atom's electron. We need to simplify this mathematically and the simplification that is shown here with the final results corresponds to the fact that we now assume that x1 and x2 in absolute values, so these displacements are significantly smaller than the distance between the two atoms. If we do this, we can write, for example, that one over r minus x1 equals one over r minus r times x1 over r, which comes to one over r times one over one minus x1 over r, okay? Now we have here something which is very, very, very small. So then we can um, express this using uh, polynomial expansion. And we would actually end up that this is approximately one over R, one minus X one over R. I believe you know such expansion from other courses, from math and so on, right? So this is the type of expansion that if you say you have uh, one over minus xi or plus minus xi, and xi is very small, then this is approximately one plus minus xi, right? Uh, good. When we do this, we end up with this term for this one. Then we end up with a similar term for this guy here, which we would end up with one over R. And then we have here one plus uh, X2 over R. From this term, we end up with one over R. So probably then I, I delete here already some things. So once again, from this term, we end up with one over R, one plus X2 over R. From here, we end up with one over R, one minus X1 over R. From this term, we end up with one over R, one plus X2 over R minus X1 over R. And here we have one minus R. When we put everything together, we end up with plus minus minus one over R, one plus one plus X2 over R minus X1 over R minus one plus X1 over R minus one minus X2 over R. Wow. And so we now see that this cancels out each other, plus x2 over r, minus x2 over r, cancels each other, minus x1 over r, plus x1 over r, cancels each other, and we end up with zero. So we end up with the approximation that this interaction is zero. That's probably not what we wanted, right? Um, what we actually did is that we have written down the interaction, then we applied a certain approximation 
based on the fact that x1 and x2 are very small? Well, probably they are not as small as we have expected here, because in the expansion, in fact, one over um, sorry one over one plus xi, we have now written it as one plus xi, and we have omitted all those terms one half psi squared plus one over three factorial psi cubed plus and so on. So this is the full expansion, right? And we said that psi is so small that all these guys can be uh, can be neglected. Now, maybe this term is not so small. So let us try to terminate the expansion after the quadratic term and include this one as well. And if we do so, the linear terms and the absolute terms would still cancel out the way that we saw it before. However, with the with the quadratic terms, we would actually end up with uh, we would end up with uh, additionally here one over r, and there would be x two squared over r squared. From here, we would end up with one over r x two squared over r squared. And from here, we would end up additionally with one over r x2 minus x1 over r squared, right? And now when we put all of this finally together, we would then end up that the total interaction here can the linear terms, they cancel out each other. And from here, we then cancel out right, explicitly one over r uh, cubed, all right, and then we have here x2 squared minus 2x1 x2 plus x2 squared minus x2 squared minus x1, so x1 here, x1 squared. These guys cancel out each other and we end up just with this mixed term. And this is what you eventually see in here, right? So this is the 2 x1 x2 one over r cubed, that's what we have here. And then we are left there with the prefactor that we had in front of this, uh, in front of this uh, uh, whole parenthesis, front of this whole term. Good. So we have now derived what is this uh, interaction. We have learned that the interaction is actually not so weak that we can neglect all the quadratic terms that we need them because otherwise uh, we do not get any interaction between the, uh, between the uh, oscillating charges. Our total Hamiltonian now is the H0 plus H1, as we have written on the previous slide, which was x1 squared k half plus uh, m p1 squared over half plus k x2 squared half plus m p2 squared half. So this is again the spring energy, potential energy of the first atom, of the second atom, kinetic energy of the first atom, kinetic energy of the second atom. And now we add here plus H1, plus this Hamiltonian, plus this interaction. Good. We want to, again, calculate the total energy to see what it is. And here we are troubled. We were able to evaluate it in the previous case because essentially there was no interaction and we were able to treat it as two separated to decoupled potential um, oscillators. Now they are not decoupled anymore. They are coupled because of this term, and the whole solution becomes uh, difficult, right? The moment I displace the charge on one of the atoms, it influences the way how the charge is going to be displaced on the other atom. Luckily, there is a way how to solve this, and this way is transformation into special coordinates. So we instead of looking for x1 and x2, we will be looking for a different set of descriptors of our system. 
X1 and X2 are the most natural ones. If you again look at the uh, picture that we have here for these two decoupled charges, and I ask you to provide me with coordinates which describe the motion of these atoms, you will naturally choose X1 and X2. I would as well, right? Because of course, uh, I'll be describing how the charge is displaced on one and how it is on the other one. But maybe we can equally well describe how are the center of masses, or center of charges displaced with respect to each other. So if I now look at the middle of this guy, and the middle of that guy, how far are these being displaced? How far are these? And what is the difference between this displacement and that displacement? So the difference would be the so-called antisymmetric coordinate, this mean uh, displacement between the, uh, between the charges caused, caused by the displacement uh, of the charges on individual atoms will be the symmetric coordinate. So when we do this transformation, you can simply try that on your own putting really from here expressing what is x1 as a function of xs and xa same thing for x2 right so then you would see what it, what you would be getting again xa x uh, s very very similar formula to this ones with this x1 and x2 you plug it simply into this formula plus the zero if i'm not wrong what you would end up with is this expression which doesn't look too simple at the first sight. However, look at it. If I look just at the motion of the center of charges, so at the xs coordinate and the corresponding velocity, how does this move? Then I obtain here terms which correspond only to this center of charges motion, but there is no intermixing with the other coordinate which describes uh, what is the difference between the individual displacements. On the other hand, this antisymmetric part is again separated. So in fact, this coupled motion of the charges, we are now able to describe as a decoupled mode in which we have a symmetric motion and anti-symmetric motion. So in, with one of them, we describe how do the two uh, centers of charges move with respect to each other, S. The other one is uh, how do the individual atoms change their individual displacements. As soon as I look at this term, the first one, and I forget about the second one for a moment. If you look at it, you should immediately spot again a Hamiltonian for harmonic like oscillator. Okay, we have a kinetic energy like term here, and this is potential energy term. If we now again say that our classical harmonic Hamiltonian looks H0 is E squared over to m plus uh, k x squared over half. And the corresponding eigenfrequency is then square root of k over m. Well, this looks pretty much like this term, fair enough. And the spring constant that we would now need has changed to something like this. That means that the eigenfrequency corresponding to this harmonic oscillator number one, and we call it actually omega uh, s, s corresponding to the symmetric coordinate, is square root. And now we have k plus e squared over 2 pi epsilon 0 r cubed over m. Yeah. Similarly, now you forget about this symmetric coordinate and to just look at the second part, 
and you would get that this again reminds you of a harmonic oscillator, this time with a frequency omega a, which is square root of k minus p squared over 2 pi epsilon 0 r cubed over m. The capital R here is not a coordinate. This is descriptor of my system saying how far are these two atoms. All right? Good. So I have now these two frequencies. And the last thing that I'm trying to do here is to simplify again this expression by assuming that the second part here is fairly small. What we have done is that we expressed omega zero, which is the square root of k over m. So we've taken this outside of this whole expression. And assuming that the second part is very small, we now have a term, depending on whether we are anti-symmetric or symmetric term, uh, we get a term which is of the form one plus alpha to one half, where alpha is very small. And this can be, again, uh, expressed as a series, it can be expanded in that. Here, the expansion is a little bit more involved. Uh, and we would essentially end up with the terms that we have here. And again, similarly to the uh, expression of uh, the interactions we had on the previous slide, we need to go beyond the linear term. Right? So we need to take also the harmonic term here. When we put all of this together, the total energy of now the interacting pair of atoms is one half h bar omega a plus one half h omega s. Right? So this is the one oscillator, this is the second oscillator. And this is now our total energy. Good. Do we gain anything by switching on this interaction? In other words, does this interaction between the dipoles make the atoms want to be together more than in the situation when they are in infinite separation and they do not interact at all? Well, let's establish what is the energy difference between the energy of interacting pair of atoms and non-interacting, which was two times one half omega zero, right? This is the total energy per one atom. We have two atoms there, two oscillators. Okay? And so this is now the total energy change. And question is whether this is smaller or larger than zero. So then we follow here the final part of the derivation. And this delta u yields a term which is a negative constant here. It's a negative number over R6. Negative number means that the total energy decreases by switching on the interaction. So this is actually attractive interaction yielding attractive potential. It is, however, fairly weak because it goes like r to the power of six, meaning that at large distances, whatever large means, at large distances, it's negligibly small. Now, this maybe reminds you of already something that you have seen before. And the thing that you have seen before is Van der Waals potential or Leonard Jones interaction potential. This is, however, now coupled together with repulsive force coming from Pauli exclusion principle. So the moment that we would bring the atoms too close together because of this uh, um, one over R to the power of six interaction, which of course decreases, decreases, decreases with, de uh, sorry, so it lowers the energy with decreasing R, so eventually leading to the collapse of the system. The moment when we bring the atoms too close together, the 
clouds of the electrons, they start overlapping. We start get their, start getting their uh, qu quantum mechanical effects, which state that no two electrons, no two fermions can occupy the same place at the same time in the same state. So we get an increased repulsion. The system will start being unhappy when the atoms are close together. We get this repulsive force. This repulsive force can be fitted nicely with an one over r to the power of 12 dependence, finally yielding this uh, 12 six potential known as Leonard Jones potential or uh, very often also Van der Waals potential. A question of uh, or a fun fact here is that Leonard Jones is actually a single person when uh, Jones first uh, published his results. He still uh, was unmarried and only later on he has taken his wife's name, Leonard, and uh, eventually uh, giving this name to the well-known potential, which is however not coming from Leonard and Jones, but it comes from a single person called Leonard Jones, John Leonard Jones. So what can we do with this potential? Let's play around with that a little bit. I said at the beginning <clears throat> that the Van der Waals interaction is important for uh, rare gas, uh, where rare gases, when they crystallize um, in some crystalline structure, which is obviously happening only at very low temperatures, but let's play around this. So we think about low temperatures, probably high pressure so that we force these uh, inert gases even to interact to form solid state. Okay? The solid states, the interactions obviously are gonna be very, very weak. So Leonard Jones potential, Van der Waals potential seem to be a reasonable description for this. Uh, in this table, which is taken from Kittel's book, we have a certain parametrization of these parameters, epsilon and sigma, uh, which fully determine the interaction potential for a series of rare gases. And we'll be playing with this a bit now here. And uh, for those of you who want to, again, gain some additional understanding and are going to do the uh, assignment, then the assignment is exactly about uh, this Leonard Jones potential. We can use it to calculate the equilibrium distance, equilibrium spacing between atoms. What do we have here? We actually express the total energy uh, of our system. Let's suppose that we have a system with n atoms. The atoms are labeled one, two, up to n. Okay. The Van der Waals interaction expressed by the Leonard Jones potential, acts between any pair of these atoms. Now we do not consider any periodic boundary conditions. Let's not complicate it with this. Let us uh, assume that our n atoms form a topologically close space, right? So we express only all interactions between the atoms that we have inside of this ensemble. So we actually want to say that our total energy is a sum over all pairs. And then we have here the Van der Waals interaction for the atoms at a distance R i j. What is this? Well, this is nothing else than the one, uh, sorry, one uh, for epsilon times um, sigma over R. I j to the power of 12 minus sigma over r i j r of six. Uh, we want now to express it per atom. So our total energy per atom 
-hmm. Now I'm have clash of uh, clash of uh, notation. So let's use this uh, capital U as a bold one, which I will do here this way. Okay, and the uh, total energy per atom is the total energy of the whole system. So the bold one divided by the number of atoms. Okay. Uh, And well, now I do have the clash of the notation because actually the factor that we have here is indeed the total energy of the whole system, not per atom. So this would be the bold term. Okay. Uh, this is not so important. The sums that we have here, uh, then if we, if we go with the sum over i j, of all of these van der Waals potentials, R I J. It can be simply written as a sum over all atoms, sum sigma over all its pairs, paired atoms. So I want to uh, go over all pairs um, where I have the van der Waals fraction of this R I J. Now, assuming that each atom has the same environment, has the same uh, distribution of the paired atoms, we can then simply say that these inner sums are identical for all the atoms. Right? My atom here interacts with all the nearest neighbors. Okay, That's what I get here. Uh, the other guy interacts again with all its nearest neighbors. That's what I get here again. Uh, well, not only the nearest neighbors, all the neighbors and this term is going to be the same for all the atoms. So eventually I can say that this equals to number of atoms I have times, and now I need to have some interaction on the walls. For example, between atom one and all other atoms. So I have here the sum over J. This first part here is really one. I say atom number one. Uh, the slight problem here is that now I double counted each bond. So I need to put here one half of this whole thing in order to have the total energy, right? Because I counted in this expression, in this first expression, I count the energy corresponding to the bond between atom I and J, as well as between atom J and R. So I get here the factor one half. And the last thing that I will do is that I express all of these distances as a multiples, as fractions of the lattice parameters. If you think about it, uh, and this, this already takes into account the fact that we probably want to think about crystalline material. Right? So if I have material, where the atoms are arranged on an FCC lattice. And I take another one where the atoms are further apart. Then labeling this with capital R, it being the lattice parameter. Here again, I have capital R. These fractions, so this distance, whether this is the R12, now this is R12 green. R12 green is still going to be square root of two over half R. The same thing is here. Okay? This is square root of two over half of the red R. So I want to express that each of these distances are the same fractions, square root of two half, which represent the crystalline structure times the corresponding lattice parameter, R. That's what I have in, in here, finally, that I put here these fractions, Pij, which are the fractions to the next and third and fourth coordination shells, times R, where R is the lattice parameter. Or maybe I choose R as the uh, lattice binding, so, so the, the length of the bond, the 
it means the R12 smallest distance is going to be R, and then all the others are multiples of this R. It does not really matter, right? Whether you express it as in terms of the cubic lattice parameter or in terms of the distance between two neighboring atoms. When we do have this, uh, we can now calculate uh, for which spacing between the atoms. I now take the same structure and just expand it, make it larger and smaller. And I can calculate for which distance between the atoms I obtain the overall minimum. And this corresponds to the equilibrium. So to get a minimum of a function, I calculate the derivative of that function with respect to the parameter that I can change. And obviously the spacing between atoms is the parameter which describes the size of the crystal. Uh, I put this derivative equal to zero, which is the mathematical condition for having an extremum. In this case, for, for the physical argumentation, we expect here to have indeed minimum. And you end up with an expression that this uh, optimum or equilibrium lattice spacing uh, is a certain and fixed fraction of the parameter sigma. The parameters alpha and beta here, which are given here, they depend on the crystal structure. So the expression that we have here is given for FCC structure, for face-centered cubic structure. Right? If you have a different structure, BCC, the parameters alpha and beta are different. This value is slightly different, and therefore R0 would be slightly different as well for the same potential. If we now look which uh, fractions, which uh, really experimental uh, lattice parameters do we get for these uh, different, four different um, rare gases, we see that the R0 over sigma is surprisingly close to this expected unique fraction uh, value 1.05. Okay. So actually, description of the binding between the atoms when they are in FCC crystal uh, using the Leonard Jones potential is very reasonable. That's the message that we get from here. Uh, we uh, use the experimental data to fit parameters epsilon and sigma. Sigma is the important one here. Uh, everything else is given just by geometry. We know that our crystals are FCC. So we combine this geometrical information together with the parameter sigma that is fitted to the experimental data, obtain a certain value of R0, and now compare this value of R0 with that one that we actually get from experiment. And again, these values are very close to each other, yielding the conclusion that the Van der Waals or Leonard Jones potential is very reasonable approximation. Another thing that we can do is to calculate the cohesive energy. So actually to see what is the energy of the system at this equilibrium lattice parameter. It's a straightforward way to plug in the value of this equilibrium spacing we derived on the previous slide. We plug it into the uh, total. Uh, total energy or total uh, formula for the total energy of the system. Now we express it per atom. So we divide it by the number of atoms. We get rid of this n in, uh, to, in the size dependence of the system. And we end up with a certain value. Okay? Again, we see that for the uh, FCC crystal, FCC crystal is coded in this alpha and beta and eventually it's coded in this uh, value. 0.61, uh, we then get that the cohesive energy itself, the depth of the well, depends solely on the parameter epsilon. It is not completely solely on the uh, epsilon because the dependence on the sigma comes through the parameter R0. Okay. We can compare those values again with uh, so, so those that we obtain from the fitted potential with those that uh, come really from the experiment, uh, which were used for fitting this uh, 
Leonard Jones potential. And again, we see that this uh, agreement is very satisfactory. That means that our potential, Ivan de Vals potential, or Leonard Jones potential, does a very good job to describe the binding in these crystals. Any question to the Van der Waals bonds? What is playing around with the uh, weakly bonded crystals? Everything's clear. That makes me happy. I hope that there is still someone on the other side. I do see a lot of participants here. Anyone gives me a quick thumb up that you hear me, that everything's working as it should. And it's not just me and my tablet here. Yes, thank you, Urshi. Thank you. And one question. So oh. what you did was uh, use the Leonard Jones uh, mm -hmm. equation to derive kind of the dissociation energy. Yes. Essentially, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. That's what here in, the, in solid state physics we call the cohesive energy. So it's the energy uh, that you gain when you bring the isolated atoms from infinity to form the crystal. So how much energy you gain by uh, forming the crystal. Or in other words, how much energy you have to put in the system to um, decohese it, so to, to really decompose it into individual atoms, isolated atoms, separated at infinity. Yeah, and is there a reason that the predicted value was, uh, that all of the experimental values were more than that predicted uh, from the equation? Um, that's a good point. Um, honestly speaking, I believe that this is related just to the fact that the Leonard Jones potential does pretty good job, but not 100% job, right? So it's still an approximation and it is uh, based on the range of experimental data but, uh, which were used to fit it. And probably uh, the potential is unable to pick the complete depth of the potential well, which would be the experimental data, uh, or actually it, uh, it overestimates it, right? Because with the experiments, we, uh, with the fitted potential, we get the depth, uh, the potential depth uh, deeper. So if I put it in the graph, it probably the experimental data looks something like this. Now, when you are trying to and, and there would be somewhere here, maybe the zero value. And now you are trying to fit this with the Leonard Jones, which has in principle, just two fitting parameters right? that has only epsilon and sigma. So there is not so much degree of freedom. And in order to fit all this data everywhere equally well, you just overshoot it slightly here in the, in the minimum, right? Yeah, but if you add more terms to make the prediction better, where how can you add more terms? Because you just derived it. There are no other terms. There are there are no other terms here for this Leonard Jones potential, right? But then you start tweaking this um, analytical formula that we have here by simply saying, okay, I, I need more degrees of freedom for fitting. I probably need to add more parameters, maybe uh, instead of fixing this, uh, where do we have it? the exponent six and 12, right? Here, for example, I can, I can make this as, a, as additional degree of freedom. Or I can, of course, go to completely different types of potentials. Um, again, if you look at what we said at the beginning, this whole term, where we are here, right? So this, uh, it's a lot of slides, right? So, Already this, this part here is based on our approximations that we terminated the expansion somewhere. So it's never written that it's really this and that they are not missing some higher order terms. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah? One part, second part, then you come again to the, sorry, what's written on this slide. And it's written, written that the empirical finding is that the 
repulsive part can be reasonably well fitted with this. But again, it's nowhere written that it's really uh, B over R to the power of 12, that you cannot do better job if you would go to something like that, or maybe M is very close to 12, or maybe you add their additional terms and so on. Okay. So yeah. all, all of this would be, um, well, it, it essentially then goes towards the fitting of interatomic potentials and adding more terms, tweaking it to have as accurate description of the interaction as possible. Okay. Hmm? Good. So let us come to the ionic crystals. Um, the ionic crystals, they are characteristic by exhibiting a charge transfer. I've said already at the beginning that for that we need at least two species. One would act as a donor of electrons and one would act as an acceptor. So here we have an example of sodium chloride in this, uh, in this image down here, where sodium gives one electron which is transferred to chlor atom. Or another example here, where lithium, which has one unpaired valence electron, gives this unpaired electron to fluor, by which the fluor is able to close the valence shell. So finally, it has a closed configuration, which makes it uh, energetically more convenient. However, the resulting ion is going to be negatively charged. And then we have the interactions, really electrostatic interactions between a positively charged ion that gave the electron away and the acceptor that accepted the, uh, the electron and is, positive, is, is negatively charged. Um, the characteristic crystal structures for um, the ionic crystals, when we talk about the simple ones, are B1 and B2. So those are the structures that we met already last week when we spoke about the sodium chloride structure, indeed what we have here. And we also have the cesium chloride structure. That was the one which looks like a BCC structure and has a one atom of another type right in the middle, right? So this part uh, is, is a different atom. What you see on the map down here is a charge distribution. So you see an isocharge lines corresponding to the uh, spatial places uh, with the same density of charge. And what you see from here is that the isocharge lines are fairly spherical. There are some asphere, aspherical parts only uh, very near to the middle of the connection between the atoms. And this is essentially the overlapping charges. This is effectively the part where the charge transfer corresponds to zero. So here is a lot of charge missing everywhere, uh, going less and less and less. And then we have a lot of charge again given here. This would be the parts with very small uh, very small charges. Okay. Uh, if you would forget about an at, uh, the charge uh, bit between the atoms being in a crystal, and you think about an isolated atom, then an isolated atom has indeed this spherically symmetrical charge distribution. So this is why we say that the bonding here is not directional, the charge is distributed uh, everywhere with the same probability or almost everywhere with the same probability. And therefore the interaction between chlorine and sodium is the same in this direction as it would be if sodium has moved in this direction and uh, provided that the distance is the same. We can try a very simplistic, again, expression, looking at the energetics, how this uh, ionic bonding is formed. 
we take a neutral sodium atom and invest some energy into the system to take one of its valence electrons away. We need to invest 5.14 electron volts to take its valence electron away and by that create the positively charged uh, sodium atom. Now we make another step. We are in a completely isolated box with um, neutral chlor atom and we bring this one electron to it. Chlor is electronegative, it would attract the electron. It attracts it a lot and creates eventually this negatively charged pro, uh, uh, chlor ion, by which, because this is an attractive interaction, it would release energy of uh, 3.61 electron volt. Right? So I have invested some energy to create the electron, then I brought it to the chlor. A bit of the energy has been paid back, but not yet, right? You have a separated sodium plus and chlor minus by transferring the electron from sodium to chlor. I still need to invest energy in the system. Now I can take these two ions, and bring them together and form the crystal. By doing this, by bringing these two atoms from infinity to form sodium chloride a crystal, I gain energy of 7.9 electron volt per formula unit. That means per pair of these ions. So my overall energy balance is that I needed to invest energy to create a positively charged sodium atom or ion. But then at the end, I gain some energy by bringing this electron to the core. And eventually, I gained a lot of energy by bringing these two ions, plus sodium and minus chlor together. And the overall uh, energy balance yields that by creating this whole thing, I gain actually 6.4 electron volt per formula in it. This is the energy that I gain. You can also think about it that way that you simply have the, uh, the, the uh, electrically neutral atoms you start bringing them together, and as you are bringing them, of course, there is the uh, gradual charge transfer from sodium to chlor, right? And that will eventually lead to the same uh, expression or the same value that we have here. What I just wanted to say here is that we can also think about it stepwise and really separate each of these contributions. Now, the point I want to make here is that this value, 6.4 electron volt per formula in it, is mostly given by the electrostatic interaction. We take an extremely simplified estimation of how much electrostatic energy we have per bond in between two charged particles when one has a charge plus one electron, the other one has a charge minus one electron, and they are at the separation of the equilibrium uh, lattice parameter of sodium chloride. This equilibrium separation, how does the crystal look like again? If I look at the crystalline structure, uh, it's an FCC-based structure where the sodium atoms look at the FCC structure and the chlor atoms look at, uh, sit at the interstitial sides. It means the distance that I have between the plus and minus charges is actually one half of the cubic lattice constant. That's what I have here, the one half. I have included here that the charge transfer is exactly one electron. Again, an estimation uh, corresponding to this naive chemistry picture that uh, the sodium atom uh, gets rid of one electron by which it again uh, yields a um, system with a closed valence shell, gives it to one chlor, which then closes its valence uh, shell. So we have the full one electron transfer, electrostatic interaction, nothing more. And from this, you get that the electrostatic interaction pair is one bond, really per the nearest neighbors, is 5.12 dB. 
It's a value which is a remarkable fraction of the total cohesive energy. That means really the electrostatic interaction between these charged particles is the major contribution towards the, uh, uh, towards the bonding in ionic crystals. In fact, we should be including lo longer distance uh, interactions as well. So in the previous estimation is extremely simplified one, we have considered only the nearest neighbors. But similarly to what we did for the um, cohesive energy with the Leonard Jones potential, we should now include also the electrostatic interaction between uh, all the atoms all the ions that we have in the system. Why? Well, while the interaction between the nearest neighbors is attractive, the second nearest neighbor is already with the same charge as my atom, and therefore they will experience repulsive interaction. Right? So it's always a very tight fight between attractive and repulsive forces, depending on how many shells you take into account. And that is exactly expressed by this formula, where now we express the electrostatic pair interaction. Again, here we have the distance between two ions. Uh, we then have generally that the ion I has a charge QI, ion uh, J has a charge QJ. These charges can be plus minus the same value, right? So we really uh, assume again in this simplified picture here that we have a charge transfer from one atom to another atom and the, that there is no third species or no other stoichiometry than one to one. No other stoichiometry, I mean, for example, with uh, titanium dioxide, you would then uh, think about uh, one titanium atom donating charges to two oxygen atoms. So therefore then the charges on titanium and oxygen would be different. Here we assume the stoichiometry one to one. We have uh, the same number of species which are positive donors and the negative donors and both of them donate or accept the same charge Q. The only difference is that some of them are plus and some of them are minus values. Uh, putting this now into the formula again, uh, what we uh, how to calculate the total energy, it's in principle exactly the same thing as what we did with the Leonard Jones. The only difference is that instead of the Leonard Jones potential, we have now here the interactions, the pairwise electrostatic interactions. We have here again these factors as what we had for uh, before for the. Uh, Leonard-Jones potential with the difference that while before we had something like one over i i j to the power of six minus one, uh, sorry, that was 12, right? i i j to the power of six, and we needed to sum over all of these. Now we have there, first of all, only factor one over pi i j. So the, uh, ex the, the polynomial, exponent is quite different. And secondly, we do have also the changing signs. So instead of, let's say, one plus one half plus one third plus one quarter, we have now one minus one half plus one third minus one quarter and so on and so forth. This leads to an estimation. Again, we can see that all of this is constant. We can put it in front of the, the total sum. Uh, the Avogadro number here is uh, then expressing the sum over i. And what we are left with is a sum over all pairs of atoms uh, interacting with my chosen atom i, which is equivalent for all atoms and leads to something called a Madelung constant. Madelung constant here is much more difficult to be uh, calculated or to be converged than 
the terms alpha and beta in terms of the uh, in, in the case of the van der Waals bonding or uh, the van der Jones potential. And the reason for this is that we have always this uh, changing type of interaction. Right on the first nearest neighbor shell, I have the um, the repulsive, sorry, the attractive interaction on the next series, I have repulsive on the third one, I might have a repulsive or, or attractive interaction and so on and so forth. So my total energy, as you see here, uh, given by this running average, so these open symbols, converges only very, very small, slowly, based on the number of shells that I include. So how far do I go from my atom? So in order to really calculate the Madelung constant, I need to have extremely many pair interactions included to get a converged value. This is different to what we were doing before with the alpha and beta constants for the uh, Van der Waals, uh, for the Van der Waals bonded materials or Leonard Jones bonded materials. The Madelung constants are again. Uh, something which is purely based on the geometry uh, together with the assumption that we have the uh, alternating plus minus charges. The values are given here for the three most common uh, cases that are considered here. So this is the B1 structure, the sodium chloride. This is the B2 structure, uh, the cesium chloride. So that's the BCC with the blue atom in the middle. And here we have the B3 zinc blend structure, uh, zinc sulfide structure, which is, uh, again, we had a picture of that there last week. If you think about putting the motif on the FCC lattice, then for sodium chloride, you take the dumbbell of the two atoms and you orient it along the tube axis. Whereas for the B3, you orient it along the body diagram. So that's why you get here that the nearest distance between the positive and negative charges is half of the cubic uh, lattice parameter. Whereas here, we get that the distance is one quarter of the body diagonal. This is the body diagonal, and we get here the one quarter. So this is exactly the length of the dumbbell as we discussed it last week. Uh, there was a question, I think, uh, if I, I just missed it. One second. Chat question. How do we normally get the Madelung constant? Is it through a calculation or experiment? Yes, it would be through calculations. So you would essentially uh, run, you, you can code this very easily, and uh, you would just need to run the sum to very, very large numbers and see how you uh, how this actually converges. And the convergence is going to be extremely slow. That means that if you terminate your sum after 10 nearest distances or 11 or 12, the result will be very different. You need to go to thousands or 10,000s of shells, which means that this interaction is very long range interaction eventually. That's other interpretation. Hopefully that answers the question. So we are coming to the uh, last two types of bonds very quickly because about covalent bond and molecular orbitals we'll be talking a lot uh, during the later parts of the lecture as well. So covalent bond um, characterized by the accumulation of the uh, charge between the atoms. Uh, it is directional and very strong bond. The homopolar or, uh, uh, sorry, the, the uh, polar or, or non-polar bonds refer to the fact whether we have, uh, whether we have one single species, as is the case uh, shown here with this charge density map uh, of germanium atom, or what could be the case for silicon or for diamond or whether we have a non-polar character where we means we have two species such as gallium and nitrogen, gallium nitride or boronitride or anything else. 
where uh, actually in order to get the desired uh, electronic configuration, one atom probably provides different or more electrons than the other atom, All right? So we need this interaction between these atoms. Uh, if I ask you about an example of covalent bond and covalently bonded materials, again, the prominent example are these hybridized orbitals, which are typical for carbon structures. SP3 bonded carbon is the diamond structure. SP2 bonded, SP2 hybridized carbon is the graphite, uh, graphite two-dimensional plane. The basis of formation of these molecular orbitals is actually sharing one orbital in which the two electrons now with opposite spins can, by, can lower the energy of the whole system uh, by sharing this orbital. So the picture that we have here, or uh, this is maybe for hydrogen uh, molecule, again, we'll discuss this uh, much more later uh, during the uh, during the tight binding model. But then what we do here is that we combine an orbital from one hydrogen and from another hydrogen to form another orbital, which has lower energy. This one orbital with the lower energy is now occupied with two electrons. That means if I have two separated hydrogen atoms, the total energy is this value plus this value. If I now have hydrogen two molecule, I have twice this value of the energy. Obviously this hydrogen two molecule then yields lower total energy than the two separated hydrogen atoms here. Means if by putting the hydrogen atoms together, I can lower the total energy. I again exhibit, I, I observe in, uh, attractive interaction and I form the hydrogen two molecule. If I apply the same thing for, for example, helium, where I have already here the spin up and spin down atom, then of course I form the same orbitals, right? And I again put two electrons in the so-called bonding orbital, but I would put also two electrons in the antibonding orbital. Because overall, I have two electrons from one helium and two electrons from another helium. And now separated helium atoms have four times this value of the energy, the hypothetical helium two molecule would have two times this energy plus two times this energy per electron, right? Um, which is in this case higher than four times the energy of the 1s orbital of isolated helium atom. And therefore there is no driving force for forming the molecular orbitals and occupying them in the molecular form. The orbitals can be uh, combined in many different ways. So we can combine the p orbitals into so-called pi orbitals. Uh, we have here examples of different, uh, uh, what we have there, all right, right, uh, of, of differently oriented uh, p electrons. So this is two neighboring atoms and along this axis, how they form the uh, bonding and antibonding orbitals. The same way as when we have the orbitals, individual p orbitals then uh, oriented perpendicular to the uh, distance between the atoms and how they form the, again, bonding and antibonding pi orbitals. So these molecular uh, orbitals. The combinations can be much more complicated than just between the, say, p orbitals as it's written here. We can have uh, hybridization, and that means interaction between s and p orbitals, forming the uh, sp orbitals. Or then, when we take two p orbitals, we have sp two hybridized orbitals. This is now the basis for this famous sp two hybridized materials. And again, the example of that is the graphene, so this would be uh, eventually leading to the honeycomb-like structure. Again, we discussed a bit 
uh, the crystallography of that last p. If you combine s orbital with three p orbitals, you end up with the uh, three-dimensional sp3 hybridized orbital, uh, which leads to this tetrahedral structure. And a prominent example of this, again, is uh, diamond. So you can stick with carbon-based materials. Or you would uh, then um, give me as an example, for example, silicon. That's another very prominent example of sp3 bonded material. We come to the final two types of bonds very, very quickly. So the metallic bond, as we have mentioned before already, uh, is based on uh, interacting of the positively charged ionic cores with fully delocalized or very strongly delocalized uh, valence electrons. Uh, these uh, metallically or metallically bonded materials, they yield much lower binding energies. So uh, they do not have, for example, such high uh, melting temperatures or do not exhibit such high melting temperatures as ionic or covalently bonded materials. It is much easier to decompose it into individual atoms. Once again, meaning that the melting would, ex uh, would, would occur at lower temperatures. These materials, they tend to form closed packed structures, HCP or FCC or BCC atoms. So if you look at the simple metals, typically these are the structures that they take. In transition metal uh, metals, such as titanium, nickel, and uh, vanadium, um, the metallic bonding from the valence electrons is accompanied by additional interaction between the uh, semi-core electrons, which are the inner shells, so just in energetically just below the uh, valence electrons, that adds additional uh, that adds additional uh, binding, additional cohesive energy to the system, and overall uh, makes the material behave as a mixture of simple metal and uh, the uh, probably covalently and ionically bonded materials. The final bond I would like to mention here, though it's not so in, of importance for uh, the let's say metallic systems or, or metallurgical systems that we can discuss here, the so-called hydrogen bond, in which uh, a hydrogen atom acts as a donor and it gives its electron back to the molecule or to its, to its parent system, leaving out pretty much a positively charged core, positively charged proton behind. And this can interact with another negatively charged uh, region in the material. Uh, it is something which is very prominent as a weak bond between hydrogen, uh, sorry, between water molecules. So you essentially end up with uh, something like H2O, right? Two hydrogen atoms. From the hydrogen, the electron comes to the oxygen. So here we get uh, the oxygen minus two or two minus. Written, right? That means here we have essentially a plus, plus charge here, plus charge here. And if I have somewhere else, the OH molecule, Again, with the uh, two electrons given here, so I get eventually the uh, negatively charged oxygen. Then the hydrogen bond or hydrogen bridge between this positively charged ion here and the negatively charged oxygen here uh, um, eventually leads to the interaction between these water molecules, uh, between the molecules forming ice and eventually leading interactions uh, to, to the solid space of ice. This is not so much of importance for the uh, metallic systems, for the crystalline systems. It's much more important for organic systems, uh, for chemistry, and uh, for, for example, interactions or bonding between DNA molecules. 
All right, that brings me to the end of today's lecture. Again, ending with the checklist of uh, some terms and uh, concepts that you should know uh, for passing this course, passing the exam. So you should know what is the model for treating the Van der Waals interaction. How do we derive the Leonard Jones potential? I do not want from you the exact derivations, all of these uh, approximations that we have made on the way. But what you should remember is that the basis for this is the displaced charge of otherwise neutral atoms, that it yields to additional interaction um, in addition to the interaction between the uh, displaced charge and the positively charged core on one single atom. So it leads to this interatomic uh, interactions uh, that the Leonard Jones potential is very useful for describing the rare gas solids. Later on, we discussed something about ionic bonds, that this is um, a bonding which is, can be ascribed mostly to the charge transfer, which is leading to non-directional but strong bonds. And that uh, unlike the convergence, quick convergence of the total energy and the interactions for Van der Waals uh, and Leonard Jones potential, here we have troubles with uh, converging this interaction because of first the different exponent of the interaction. The interaction here in the exponential form is of the form one over R, unlike the one over R to the power of six or power of 12 in the Leonard Jones potential. So it's a very long range interaction. And on top of that, we have this plus minus charges, right? So the really electrostatic interaction, which complicates it even more. On the other hand, that's the part which makes possible to actually calculate the converged value at all. If you would have only positively charged ions and all of them one over R, well, mathematically, people can show that this would diverge such some. Physically, we say, if I have only positively charged ions, there, there is only repulsive force, there is never any attraction, and uh, there will be uh, no interaction or there is no possibility that such a crystal would exist. Coming to covalent bonds, hybridized orbitals, and very important, uh, remember the directionality of these bonds. Um, and to have an idea what is the metallic bond with this uh, delocalized electrons that act as a metallic glue between positively charged ions.